hello, Tilak. Uh, hi, Michelle. Good morning. Oh, thank you. Good morning to you, too. So I, I've got no specific updates. Uh, uh, sorry for that, but I think uh, I just wanted to come here and say that. So I've been, I've been still trying to get the code uh, run, but I think uh, my skills in VHDL are not up to the mark even to understand the code. So, so I think I'm still I'm still in the process, and I'm not there yet. So I think I still need some more time. Uh, yeah, that that's the update I have for now. Okay, um, and so you're um, you're you're talking about the the example code, the I think it's Altera that was showing a, a potential improvements in in the way that the uh, like FFT IFT was laid out. Yes, exactly. That, that was the code base I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. How how um how are you doing in terms of uh, understanding their their basic idea, like the 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 mathematical concepts? Is that that clear enough at this at this point? I think I haven't still got into the part of mathematical concepts. I think I'm still there at the place where I'm trying to understand the VHDL architecture, the different uh, syntaxes in VHDL. Uh, the architecture of the core. I think I'm still there yet, but not yet have connected that to the research paper and the mathematical concepts. Okay, well, keep at it. Um, just uh, just keep keep working at it. Uh, VHDL is an interesting sort of uh, language because it's a hardware descriptive language and not not like mm -hmm. the other ones that you might be more familiar with. And and that means it's actually a yeah. smaller. It's actually a like a, a smaller footprint, so you're not very far off mm -hmm. if you're if you're making progress and you understand the goals and and you're looking at the the syntax of the language and and all of those sorts of things then then you're not you're not far off uh, you know so just keep at it uh, with a working example and and something that's uh, applicable to mm -hmm. the uh, over the air you know actual operation then it's a a pretty good pretty good project to bite into and I'm I'm not surprised that it's still a little bit intractable, mm -hmm. uh, you know. You know what you're tackling yeah. is not easy, <laughs> and right. uh, you know. But it, it might be it might be worth uh, really kind of looking more at the theory, like looking a little bit, just a little bit at the math, making mm -hmm. sure that that when you sure. when you go back to the code that you recognize what they're doing, and as long as you're yeah. past that point, that's that's good. You know, you don't need to be an expert in in FFTs or IFFTs in order to right. to get this block, um, you know, under your fingers. I mean, no, no, keep at it. Um, just, it'd be very, very worthwhile to to compare and contrast to kind of pit this against the standard implementation. Um, you know, because the 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 things that you found sure. in the in the paper are uh, are de I, they're not in the standard implementation that we're working with in Simulink. So um, I'm very interested to see if the promise in the paper can be delivered in code. Uh, in a, in an actual deployment, so that would be a a really cool thing to see, uh, and and would be a good article or or paper on its own, you know, to kind of compare and contrast. And and the the easier thing though that you brought up, the thing that was easier to implement is the mm -hmm. uh, prefix versus suffix. Yeah. And I'm I'm hoping I I, f I forgot to bring that up last week. Uh, when I met with with uh, Andreas and Leonard, so it totally slipped my mind, but it won't this week. So I'm going to ask him if it'd be okay, since the specification for Neptune is being actively revised, that we actually look at that because it would save. If 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 they're interested in a low latency design, then this is an easy thing to say. Okay, we're not going to put a prefix. We're not going to wait for the entire. Th or you know, that that you know that that the thing that that was raised in the yes. papers. Yeah, so I'll 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 bring that up a little more directly this week. Well, should they should be here? They were supposed sure. to be here, so we're. And if not, then I'll just catch them on Slack. Um, but that's a pretty okay. easy fix. That's that's you know at least in Simulink, that's a pretty easy. It's the pair of blocks that do it, and we should be able to then say, okay, here's the simulation. You know, and you could clearly see any latency effects from having a a, a prefix. So here's a essentially a suffix like and like there you go. That's just here is the raw improvement and and that's pretty straightforward. Yeah, you know, the the other things that you're you're working on are a little trickier, but you know. So I'll so I'll go ahead and bring it up and and um 
I can do two different designs that show show it. Or you could if you if you if you wanted to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was just thinking that maybe. So, sorry for the background noise, but I think uh, you know. Uh... Yeah, would that be something that you might want to tackle if you wanted to kind of take it on over the next week to show the difference between here's the design in simulation. You don't have to try to deploy it or anything like that, but like here's the design in simulation with a prefix, and here it is with a suffix, yeah. and here's the difference in the you know. I mean, it's just like the visualization, and then the markers show the difference in time. I, I expect it to be. You know, mm -hmm. a, a cl pretty clear, pretty clear win. Um, so I, I don't know if you wanted to tackle that for next week. That'd be something a little simpler. Um, you should definitely <laughs> yeah. like keep keep tackling the VHDL and the and the things that you that you identified. Just keep working it through. If you really get stuck, like you're just not getting it, then post on Slack and and um, you know, one of us will be able to work through, and sure. and. You know, be able to kind of expand on on whatever part of the language is is troubling you. Yeah, sure. I, I think I, I think I'll try that. Maybe maybe I'll, I'll start putting the paper uh, for the smelling uh, this model and, and see if there is an improvement. Okay. Uh, yeah. Maybe if I'll you, start doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It just playing around with the model is super fun, and you know, it, there might be some trickiness there too, but. It's, reach out early and and uh you know we can we can meet up and and uh, and walk through it and and show you know how to how to kind of play around with this and and show the differences uh you know don't give up on the the VHDL VHDL and Verilog are they're languages that are well within your grasp these are they're just describing hardware now i know that within that little sentence is a whole world but they're yeah. They're, they, you know, these languages are very almost formulaic, and you, the, the design patterns from from writing, you know, here's a module, here's a hierarchy, here's a top block, here's here's the thing that I want to plunk down on hardware. That makes that makes it, it's reachable, you know. So it may, of course, anything new is going to look confusing and weird, but compared to other languages, you know, VHDL and Verilog are both well within your grasp these are things that you it's like okay you can actually master all that there is in the language it's it's a fairly small number of of things that you have to work with in the language and it's all focused on describing hardware so if you maybe think of it less as a language like python and more like a way to speak hardware from software or to be to be able to like i would like to summon hardware from nothing you know i would like to yeah. then then it gets a little easier and there's lots of subtleties sure. and you know vhdl i think is a little easier it's more tractable and more predictable and more like hardware verilog is a little bit closer to c and you can get tripped up with the the uh, there's lots of things about the like the formatting and um and types so VHDL is very strongly typed, and then Verilog will let you get into trouble, more like C. So th that's the big difference. And then Verilog also has system Verilog and all sorts of other things. So it gets a lot of it probably more complicated, more abstracted. VHDL, not so much. So if you stick to VHDL and you say, I just want to describe the hardware in VHDL and reject everything else, then then you're in good shape. And it, it should you should see some some get you'll get closer to your goal over the next week. It, it'll be it'll yes, measure, yeah yeah it'll it'll be okay yeah you know <laughs> it, learning new <laughs> yeah learning yeah learning new things is hard and you're in a place where you're learning new things in all sorts of different directions like all axes of your life are learning new things right now you know <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah. but th this one's within reach you can you can master. Uh, the basics of VHDL, um, and with this particular task, it's a uh, it's a good one. It'll show you how VHDL really shines, and uh, yeah. you know. So I I have faith. Yeah, if you run into really trouble or you start to getting feeling like it's you know despair, mm -hmm. you know, no de despair is not allowed. Then just reach out and yeah. and we'll we'll fix it. 
Sure, sure. I, I do have a lot of faith and hope that I would be doing it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, good. In the next coming weeks, for sure, I should be at least coming up with the latency and skew rate. I don't know what, what technical parameters would help oh, us yeah. compare the design, you know? No, yeah, I, skew, I think I should uh, be there, yeah. Yeah, I think you just did it. You just said it. The skew, like skew rate is a, is an apt uh, phrase. And since we, our target is low latency, anything that reduces latency is, that's the highest priority. Um, and then you have to also balance that against, well, wow, this is too complicated to actually implement or like, wow, this is not fun. Okay. You know, that's, <laughs> that would be the only thing that would balance it out. But like, you know, anything of low that, and that, you know, that improves latency, that's, that's going to be the, the highest design criteria. And you've got some good things to work with. So, and I'll help however I can yeah. and, and we'll, uh, we'll muddle through. Sure. Uh, it'll, it'll work. Yeah, sure. And, and I just want to check also, uh, do, do we by any chance have some advanced licenses for caught to Prime and model sim? No, we don't. I have, uh, what we've done is we've, uh, we've got all sorts of models, uh, all sorts of licenses for, for Xilinx. Um, and so we have, the a full license for Vivado for everything. And then we have uh, a really nice startup license from from MATLAB for Simulink and HDL Coder and all that. But we haven't ever really looked over at uh, Altera or Cordis. But w so I guess my question to you is, it would it help if we did? Uh, maybe, maybe I think in, in the next coming weeks, I'll have more clarity on it. I just wanted to ask anyway and see, you know, uh, maybe if I hit any roadblocks, maybe then I would get to know. Uh, yeah. If they okay. So really need that or not? Yeah. Right. Okay. So as you're trying to set up the example code from Altera, from that Altera app note, like you know, and I think it was version seven, I think of their IDE. Um, yes. If it if it turns out that the free version doesn't work or anything that your school might have doesn't work, then let me know and we'll look into to getting a, like it, we'll, we'll ask if they have like a nonprofit option mm -hmm. or if yeah. they'd be willing to donate something to, you know, uh, to us and, and we can, we can get it set up. It didn't sound like, like when I read the paper and looked at the website it, and the app note, it didn't sound like that this was, um, a design yeah. that would trigger the paid tier because it's like it's just mm -hmm. I mean so IFFTs and FFTs okay. are like like workhorses this is like mm -hmm. really this is the, these are functions that you absolutely have to have in DSP and digital communications so it's like it is a relatively small design so I'm like it should be free so, but if you run into any problems with any software that you can't afford or your university doesn't have, then let me know and we'll we'll see what we can do. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good deal. All right. No, that sounds good. Um, and I know you're busy, so if you if you want to hang out and wait and see if anybody else shows up, that's that's fine. Uh, and if if not, then um, you have a have a have a wonderful day <laughs> <laughs> yeah sure I, I think i'll drop off and and uh, I'll get start, start getting ready to college yeah, yeah. no have Thank a have, have a wonderful a time yeah. and uh, best of best of luck with everything else and uh, and talk to you soon yeah. sure thank you Bye -bye. you bet Now seven ten seven seventeen wow seven seventeen yeah no here I am no I had a really good talk with Talak uh, about his uh, R and D and his um, no he he's uh, he's working super hard on uh, trying to to integrate understand get the the Altera um, example code working um, and they so they have an implementation like it's like hey how can we improve latency in FFT blocks. And specifically, an another paper about how to um, to kind of confront and deal with and improve latency in, I guess, essentially anything that involves a cyclic prefix. And the question raised in the paper was, hey, why do we do a cyclic prefix instead of a cyclic suffix? Because, wow, that saves some time. It's the same mathematical result.
that you get to do this circular convolution trick, but you don't have to have it as a prefix. You don't have to take like the last 82, like we do, 82 symbols or 82 samples, sorry, and put them at the front, which means that you have to wait for the entire thing to go by and then append it to the, no, like you can just, as soon as you hit any number of samples, I guess, you're like, okay, let's carve off the, the top, you know, okay, let's see if I can do this with my, with my little hands. You know, I don't know. Okay, so you do 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 do. Oh wait, okay. Like, hey, I've got my everything's going by. Da 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 da. And you're like, okay, but but this over here, this eighty two. All I can, all I have to do is wait enough to where I've got. Okay, I've got the entire thing, and then boop, I put it put it on the end as a suffix, and 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 chuck it out the door. So I don't have to wait for the whole thing take the the ass end put it on the front end and then it's it's <laughs> you know the other thing that he found was yeah, some sort of if you're streaming everything it's a, a win and let you say if you're doing it all in blocks then it doesn't really matter right but oh okay so when you say i think it still matters even though that we're doing things in frames right like it still matters because we don't have to buffer up the entire thing. Wait while we do this. Woo, do, 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 do. So why? Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 it should have occurred to me. I'm like looking for these sorts of things because we're supposed to be low latency. Since low latency is a point of the project, anything, and it seems cheap and easy, just carve it off, stick it on the back send it out and the math still works you just have to tell the receiver like okay where's the duplicate right so it works the same and it's a big improvement i mean of course it's a bigger improvement when you have a longer uh frame well, i guess the longer the frame the better improvement because otherwise you would have to wait for the entire frame to get buffered up put on a prefix and then send it out and and we have a I, what i consider to be a relatively short 1024 long you know, frame that goes to 1106 uh, with the prefix, but okay, fine. So anyway, I, it sounds like he's going to go ahead and, and investigate that and try to model it up, at least in Simulink. Um, the The tougher task that he was interested in doing was actually getting the, the um, a, a, a VHDL model of an improved version of the FFT block with some improvements, getting getting that up and running and simulated in, in Cordis, you know. So this is all on Altera parts. So. Improved over what? Huh? Improved over what? Oh, over the what's considered like the standard implementation. So there's an innovation with the with the FFT block itself. Uh, you know, uh, what was it? I don't know. We, so we talked about it last week, and I, I can go back and link in all the, the papers that he found, but there was an improvement that he was after and he's run into the usual trouble of um, Cordis installed, um, you know, working out any errors with the, you know, so there was a little bit of the the usual uh, trouble with getting that up and running and then learning a new uh, system. Um, and then it doesn't help a whole lot that everything we do is in Xilinx with Vivado. <laughs> uh, so, so I said, don't worry, keep at it, like keep working at it, but it's okay. Like if we just come up with the a quantified number of like the 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 improvement on on going from a uh, a prefix to a suffix, then that's that's a big big amount of work for in a week for somebody that already has a huge heavy schedule. So he's he's working on two different things and um yeah, you know, coming up to speed on VHDL alone. That's a uh, that's a big deal. So we have wonderful people that are they're doing great things and uh, all making making a lot of forward progress. Don't put your hands on me. I'm looking for a, a revised specification. The probably the biggest news there is to move from uh, low density parity check coding border correction to to polar. Um, that's, like a that's, big change. that's pretty big, uh, but that's just an operation that happens on the data. So, you know, the things that we're doing and, and trying to get on the air, that's a, that's a pretty 
minimal uh, effect. And since we didn't get, we have yet to get that far anyway, because we're still working <laughs> through the preambles and timing and, you know, all of that other stuff and trying to get like, okay, how do you get a resource grid on the air? You know, the mechanics of that are, uh, it's a lot of work by itself. So I'm really not too worried about the forward air correction choice. Um, and I approve and support the change. I think it will be a good one. The thing that, that I've been working on and kind of stumped about was a resettable subsystem in Simulink. And this is something that gets turned into HDL or hardware descriptive language. It gets turned into VHDL by Simulink. Simulink can export um, the VHDL code for this. And so it's a resettable subsystem and it's a block and it's like this square and you, and you can drop down anything that has a reset goes into that container and i'm like good this handles all of that reset crap that's important to us in in digital design and so i plop in the sample and hold circuit in there and it just simply doesn't work and um as of last week i had kind of complained on mathworks forums about this i'd found a couple of other people complaining about it with no answer and so now I think after an additional, like since it's been at least seven days, um, we really need this to work. So the choices are write our own function, write our own sample and hold circuit as a MATLAB function, and then containerize that and drop that into the resettable circuit or just include all the reset hardware and but that would mean routing our own reset signals throughout the simulate model which I, I you don't really want to do so i'm going to go with learning how to leverage the reset uh or or default condition uh in simulink because it's obvious to me that somehow they're flagging certain uh values as being you know on reset this is your initial conditions. This is how the oh, it's initialized. So I'm going to dig into that a little bit and see if we maybe need to write our own block for a resettable sample and hold circuit because that's the function that we need. Um, so that's kind of what I'm. Uh, that's the question that I'm bringing here to this meeting today. Is like okay, I can sit and wait for them to figure out. And get back to me on what on what I'm screwing up. Like, am I doing something wrong with this, you know, subsystem? And some systems are really important in Simulink. The entire HDL coder targeting thing, the entire export to HDL code depends on subsystems. You say, okay, this subsystem, here's the here's the logic, here's the functions, here's all of the blocks that I am wanting to turn into. VHDL code, for instance, you put them in a subsystem. And then outside of that subsystem is what would be your test bench. So all of your simulation and, you know, like inputs and then testing the outputs or whatever to support it. Um, so, I mean, okay. So you can just declare a subsystem, but there's other subsystems. There's enabled subsystems that the things in the inside that box only work when an enable signal is delivered to that block and then the resettable subsystem which is what i'm trying to use uh, and there's like a i think there's one or two more there's five total that you know different different subsystems that work but the resettable one is what i'm after and it works in other cases but doesn't work with the sample and hold block and so either there's a reason for that or it's a bug and I'll probably reach out directly to the people that I know to try to ask to fix this because if we can just export the code, that'd be awesome. But if I, but the alternative, like I said, is to go ahead and write a custom function, put that in, and that's actually in like a here's your function as a block in Simulink, and HDL coder will take that too. So the 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 way to evade this is to to write our own resettable sample and hold circuit. We, we use these in the, I think we're going to use these in more places than just the preamble train, you know, because we have the AGC 
burst and preamble A, preamble B, and it's like it comes out like clockwork, right? So we're just passing down a signal from the push to talk, like go, and then preserving the results of that signal down the chain and then handing it over to the resource grid to manage, okay, here's all your data and some control signals and some reference signals. And then we go until we hit the end of transmission, which is also kind of up in the air. The specification designer doesn't see the need for an end of transmission or an explicit post amble. I'd be a lot more comfortable if we had that so that we know that we're done rather than, oh, is this a frame that you just lost connection on? <laughs> or is it really the last frame of the transmission? So we we might set up an experiment to show the difference. I guess it just depends on the channel model, um, which is also something we know how to do now, but haven't haven't carried out. <laughs>
in the in this particular case, since since I'm on the transmitter side. Well, on the transmitter side, it's easy. You just transmit the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. I, so I I get an easier job here as as trying to implement that first. Um, but yeah, like, what if it fades in halfway through the AGC burst? You know. And I think that should work. Like the tran the receiver should be able to handle that. And and I think we'll we'll be able to do it when we get there. Yeah, I'm I'm without like a I mean with only a transmitter, there's only so much we can test for the for Neptune. Um but I'm Yeah, and it's not that much. Right, it's not that much. But I mean we can prove to me, I'd say I I I assert we can prove that we're specification compliant and we can contribute to the specification being good uh and you know andreas i think is uh he's got a receiver so he's got a receiver that he has uh modeled up in python so that may be good enough like we may be able to to do a proof of concept that it can be received uh i'd like to move to to doing a receiver as quickly as possible to me, like the since the specification is still kind of in flux, like for example, the move from uh, LDPC to Polar Codes is a pretty big one. So being on the transmitter side, that's a little bit better uh, for us right now. That we just keep making a, a nice, solid hardware uh, trans transmitter, and when we feel like the specification has settled and is something that we can rely on. And if there isn't a, a receiver that we can just use, um, then we can move to like to to receiver uh, design. So that's kind of my my instinct or feeling right now. So I'm just happy as a client. I'm working on transmitter stuff. It's it's super fun, and where the learning curve is pretty damn steep uh, anyway. With uh, trying to get HDL coder, MATLAB Simulink, uh, working with a, a you know a really talented team of of people that are trying to make a a particular uh, communications product for a particular environment and all of the math and all of the, you know, this is, this is enough that just working on the transmitter side is totally enough. And I think we're making really good progress. So, so super happy about it. It's, it's been great to work with everybody. So that's, that's good. All of the other receiver side stuff though is in my mind. That's <laughs> Um, yeah. Yeah. You got to do them both. So might as well start with the easy one, especially when you're working with tools that aren't entirely familiar. No, they're not. And they're, we do have a, a, a pretty big benefit. So for, for having the, the startup license that we have, we have a pretty, so, you know, we have a, a decent amount of, of the uh, education credits from MathWorks, and they're asking us if we want to set up another uh, class, another training session. So I'm trying to figure out how it would, how we could set up training that would directly benefit, um, like Neptune, High Freya, and, and anybody else that wanted to do FPGA work, you know, with MATLAB Simulink, HDL Coder, like SDRs, analog devices, chips. So we have these this opportunity and it'd be silly not to to go ahead and use it. So I mean the questions that we have today are different than the questions that we had a year ago. So I think it would be a different class. Um but it would require some effort on our part to help define that that class that training uh, and some of the stuff would cut pretty close to the bone on things that that MathWorks is is really that are that are still things that are not totally uh, free and clear from from MathWorks things that the problems that they want to solve on the SDR side especially they have clear goals about fixing issues with all the the three different companies xilinx and analog or amd now <laughs> analog devices and mathworks this is three different companies trying to work together to make 
uh, design and, and implementation deployment of prototypes for FPGA and SDR work. Um, so so we're the, the things that we want to do actually are pretty cl good, cutting close to the quick. And the class that we would ask for would be one that would require them to, to kind of come close to um, probably the most active and innovative parts of what they're doing. So we have to decide whether or not to press for that and offer that, try to offer that, or focus on something very prosaic, like a particular issue, or like, hey, we're going to do a class where you walk through the design in HDL Coder of some sort of DSP function that we're interested in. Maybe it's polyphase filters, maybe it's uh, FFTs, maybe it's, I don't know what, you know, somebody listening might might have a, a really good suggestion and then just focus on that one practical chunk and then have a like, one or two day class on that probably one eight hour class on that assuming you walk in the door with with what we already know like if you're a active volunteer on our projects you probably know about hgl coder and matlab simulink and let's just assume that you do and like fill in the middle of the owl like the circle and the owl like somewhere we're going to skip to the middle and we're going to try to fill in that part you know for a particular component that that is useful for us and also outside of us and and then open source it all. So that may be the right answer for this year. You know, rather than expecting them to solve the API mismatch problem, for instance, or you know, to get around it or uh you know, so or, or you know, something more 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 broad or or, uh, or hard. I mean, it's all hard, but like, you know, Pick Plus. something hard that's like definable. Like it's like this is a particular thing we're tackling that other people are tackling too. Exactly how do you have this this arc and stick the landing? And one or two days might be enough. Right. A, a class is a, is sort of a way to fill in the blanks of tutorials, right? There's the classes classes of things. Okay, these are the things we've already written tutorials for. If they're good tutorials, you don't need a class. And then on the other end of the spectrum there, these are the things we don't even know how to do. And they yeah. can't be classes or tutorials. Right. So the classes, the best thing for classes is the stuff that they just, they know how to do it, but they haven't quite gotten around to writing a good tutorial yet. And if, or the people who do the classes are distinct from the people who are writing these tutorials and they know how to do it, but the people writing tutorials don't. So, you know, okay. using a class for routine stuff is, is sort of a waste in this case where the documentation is incomplete and the uh, everything's cutting edge. Every, everything on the cutting edge is on the bleeding edge. It'd be nice to, to find some niche there where we can make the, the class creators add to the base of things that are over here in the tutorial camp. Okay, that's really helpful. Okay, I think that we'll, I'll, I'll take this and I'll think about it and I'll uh, talk with our, with our folks at, at MathWorks and see, and see what we can do. Um, if it was me at MathWorks and, and I heard an interest in a class filling in the blanks left and, you know, the blanks that you have in the tutorials, the gaps that you have in tutorials, I would be completely thrilled at, at such, like, <laughs> thank you for being an awesome partner. Let's, let's, let's do this, you know. Um, so, so maybe that, that would be a, a really uh, productive uh, use of our mutual time. Um, there's also a lot of stuff. I mean, we could grind through a whole bunch of DSP basics and, and, have a tutorial classroom session about that you know but to me it's like if you're already here either either you already know it uh or you're willing to go do it like you're willing to go find the existing tutorials about basic dsp iq modulation that sort of thing on your own and if if you can't find it we can we can direct you to it but if we keep providing that sort of level then we won't get traction in the in the places where there has been no real published work. And I think that's what we want to focus on. So yeah, I'll take this back and see if we can yeah. construct something that, that that benefits us and also 
Do you have a gap in your tutorials? Like, hey, let's make one together. And here, here we are. We have people that want to, you know, make a so mutually beneficial. That's that's motivates me a lot. Yeah, that unfortunately that leaves you with a very narrow range of things that you can work on. But hopefully, there will be things that are useful to us. So. Well, that's yeah, good. yeah, I think I it think is. With the, especially with a volunteer, a set of volunteers doing the work, they've already sh shown that they're self-motivated and they're willing to pick up a book and read it and understand it if the book has been written. <laughs> right. If the book hasn't been written yet, then. Right. Or if it's written in a way that is impenetrable <laughs> or, 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 or wrong. You know, it's all about how to do it on a Spartan 6. Then. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. You know. Well, the Spartan 6 came up just this past weekend at the Vintage Computer Festival. And I asked the Aquarius fellow, what, so what license have you chosen? And, and, you know, it, it took, I had to clarify about, about that, but misunderstood. But he, he did. He, and I see why, um, but his, so they've chosen creative commons as a license for their work on their project for, for Aquarius, um, Aquarius plus, but he chose so this, attribution. Yes, which is yeah, uh, uh, right for for attribution, um, which is which is fine. I think I, that's the right answer, and and it's it's cool. And then they chose one. Like that's what I was after. Is like, have you actually chosen a license rather than assume that just posting it is good enough? And and no, they they. But the the choice of Spartan Six was interesting because, you know, you spend a lot of time talking about how they wanted this to be an open source project. And I was, I was like, so I had two questions in my mind listening to the talk and it was, okay, so what open source license did you choose for your hardware and your software and why? And then why did you choose the Spartan 6 over the icebreaker and the lattice open source friendly, all this other stuff? Like, so why Spartan 6? Cause it was, and it wasn't Spartan 6, it was Spartan 5. And then they transitioned to Spartan 6, which a lot of us consider to be obsolete, but really isn't. Um, but it's kind of obsolete-ish with an asterisk, like Xilinx does a lot of things, but they do actually ensure the longevity of their parts. And the parts they, that sell anyway. The parts that sell and good. So I was, but I was very curious and I, you know, so other people started actively asking questions in the room and you know, I probably should have taken the opportunity when he was at the table, you know, on Sunday and went, oh, you know, to, to say, hey, I have a question about your choice of Spartan 6, but I, but I didn't, you know, so, so maybe I'll write him, but it was, um, I thought that was kind of interesting. It's like, you've chosen a proprietary part with a legendarily proprietary system, but there's this other whole ecosystem out here for FPGA. And I suspect it's going to be, I kind of anticipate the answer being, oh, well, that's just more familiar with. And once you're, if you choose like one of these ecosystems, like being a Xilinx person means a lot. It means Vado, Xilinx parts, all sorts of assumptions, all this stuff comes with it. And switching over to one of the others, um, and, and, also, and now there's, you know, at least, a credible open source alternative, you know, for smaller designs for Lattice, it's a big learning curve, like, like a whole ecosystem. You have to kind of give that up. So I, I suspect that that was going to be the answer, but he mentioned I think that's Lattice. probably going to be part of the, it's going to be part of the, the answer. Other part of the answer I suspect is that the Spartan six might be, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but the Spartan six might be the most powerful device for which there's a affordable dev board. They sure, well, starting with like the Spartan 3, because the Spartan 3 design kit was was everywhere. We have one. <laughs> you know, we inherited one when the Spartan 3 was definitely obsolete. But the Spartan 6 was a huge mega hit. And yeah, I mean, there's this, it drags along all this baggage and, and 
and leverage and e examples and running code and, and all of that. But he mentioned Lattice in the talk. So I, I heard that and I was like, so he's aware of it. He's not unaware. Like, you know, it'd be hubris on my part to say, so I, you know about Lattice open source icebreaker, you know, I don't want to be that person, you know, but they know about it and they chose Spartan 6 anyway. So we get this as well with the, why don't you just use open source FPGA designs? And I'm like, because, well, it doesn't, we would have to spend all of our time on developing the tool to get it up to the point where it could handle the size of designs that we're doing. And we we can either be tool users or we can be do tool developers, tool makers. And if a, if somebody wanted to come along and join ORI or, or if they brought a project they wanted us to help with, we would totally help a project that wanted to design better tools. But like for the, for the projects, for these communications projects, they're like, they're, tool users. They want to use tools. And as of today, or as of a year ago, when these decisions were made for these various projects, there is no comparison. So it, and it reminds me of a conversation uh, that Matt Addis had. Um, so this is now multiple years ago. This is, this is before COVID where Matt Edis was, was, you know, kind of confronted on, on Twitter. Uh, from someone who wanted to know why in the world, um, basically like wh why why do you keep choosing proprietary parts? You're you're so much into open source. Why would you do it? And his response was, okay, so we're now on the 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 USRP three three point uh, three point oh series of or th like a three ten, um, you know, and that family, and and now we're well beyond that. But this was at like the the three ten was like new. And he said, to be totally blunt with you, the not even the USRP one at this point, like the very first USRP, could be implemented on open source FPGA hardware and tools. So what am I supposed to do as a as somebody that wants to to bring, you know, lab grade SDRs to you? I I can't. Like there's this enormous gap. And I can either keep making the products with proprietary parts, or I can work with you and we get a little bit further. And this is a very painful thing to hear when you're the person pulling for open source wanting to win or wanting an open source alternative. And you have to, it's essentially, I picked my battle and my battle was to deliver you things that enable amazing open source work in the community, but all that open source work is now software and not hardware. And okay. And in a, in a sense, we are also making the same decision by using proprietary closed source tools to produce open source work. This open source work, I think probably can't be duplicated by the open source community with the open source tools, but have, as we found out, the proprietary tools have an enormous amount of baggage and problems on their own. The problems that we've experienced and seen firsthand are serious and the companies are, as far as I can tell, seriously trying to address it, but it's not a slam dunk either way. So that conversation that Matt Edis had on Twitter and his very clear, I mean, like in old school Twitter, very and it didn't get very many words saying it's a question of performance. You know, can you open source vibe and open source zealotry and and sort of like philosophy? Okay, that's great. We believe in this and we say, okay, yes, that is that is what we would like to achieve. But the parts and the software actually has to deliver at least the equivalent results. Like you have to deliver at least equivalent performance. Maybe because it's open source, you'll accept a difference, like a decrease in the quality, a little more, less hardware supported with your OS, whatever. But there comes a point in time where it's so different. The gap is so big that it breaks for a lot of people. And they're like, it's just too frustrating. And we're going to go back to Windows with respect to like Linux. 
and you, this is something you have to be mindful of. You have to pick your battles. Like what's your, what's your core competency? What is the thing that you really want to do? And you need to deliver that. And, you know, giving in to a, a philosophy or, or a non-technical uh, kind of rubric it's tricky. So, so that's kind of, I don't know, that's, that's one of the big decisions that projects have to make is, do you want to be a tool maker or do you want to be a tool user? And then if you're a tool user, are you going to just use open source tools? Are you just going to limit yourself to that? Um, and in some cases, there aren't any. <laughs> You'll have to make them from scratch. And in some cases you have some, but they're not going to deliver the performance. And this all affects the number of volunteers that you attract and the people that you're able to train and the capability that you're able to donate back to the community. So we'll use whatever tool we can. And the point is, is to deliver an open source design and, and to also feed back anything that we learn from this to open source tool makers. They need to know the flaws, which are exploitable, and the, the status and the capabilities and the cool features and the annoying shit, they need to know that. And so that's kind of what we're also after is to then feed this back to, uh, you know, the amazing projects like Amaranth and, and others. Yeah, this set of problems is sort of redoubled in the FPGA world because FPGAs are fundamentally a prototyping technology uh, to, to push hardware up a notch you know before we have to go to asics and the question is always well why don't you just use a processor for that and the answer is always well we will as soon as we can yes and so we will as soon as we user, can the user is a great example of that because most user users don't even know or care that there's an fpga in there they just know that it's a fast a to d converter that they can hook up to their very fast processor and do a lot of DSP. And that's great because all that stuff really is open source or can be anyway. That's where GNU Radio comes in. Um, and then on the other side where you're actually making products that have FPGAs in them, you're in a weird niche. Um, I only know a few classes of products that come out year after year with FPGAs in the product. Uh, video switchers are in that category now. Um, and things like usurps, uh, probably a bunch of others that I don't know about because they're specialty items in their own fields that I'm not familiar with. But, you know, as soon as you make the hundred thousandth of them, you know, why am I buying FPGAs when I can just make an ASIC? So it's a, it's a systematically narrow part of the market that and that'll never change because uh, FPGAs are always going to be in that category where they're more expensive than ASICs and less expensive than than hardware or software. Right. They're a dynamic thing that gets you from one place around. to another. Like a FPGAs get you from one place to another. And if they it gets, get you get there. You in the next year's state of the art or next decade's state of the art. Right. Uh, and if it's next decade, then it could be in the product. If it's next year, then it's just a prototype. And either way is fine. And the skills are good. They're portable. They're things that people need to know. To me, it's like a three-legged stool. You've got GPUs. So graphical processing units now are a player and then FPGAs, which I include ASICs. So FPGAs or ASIC, depending on your volume and then general purpose processors. And it's just a ratcheting thing through time. Which one has the, which, which leg of the stool is higher? It varies. It depends. It depends on the problem, problem space. It, it depends on the market size too. Like that's a big deal. So, you know, you just, yes. I like that that image because when the stool gets too tall, you're, you're in an unstable situation. You have to <laughs> bolt a ladder to one leg of the stool just to get up to the seat. Yeah. And then everybody else is like, oh, shit, we need to do things. We need to do something. And they do. They they will. They're like responding to the to the competition. And that's that's all there is about it. Like, you know, I, if you get too rigid or brittle in your opinions and positions then you will only end up getting 
broken. So, you know, you have to kind of watch out and, and go with it, go with the flow. You can't be too wishy-washy though. You know, you have to contribute back something to this community of, of engineering and, and publishing like, okay, let's try it. So to me, let's, let's see, or let's find out, let's go do it. Let's, let's pick something, um, you know, that needs to be de demonstrated. And the process of thought behind that is it can range from no one's ever done it before. Uh, and no one has ever done it before because there's good reasons that no one does it to no one's ever done it before because it doesn't match up with the very narrow silos of of commercial work. And if you do prove out a good design, then you've added something significant that may illuminate a future product in a direction that you've never anticipated. So that's that's kind of the goal, you know. Um, and also just increasing capability. Like none of the stuff is uh, non-innovative or dumb to do. It's all super good uh, learning and and uh, and good prototypes. And and you know what? A lot of it is uh, is super useful in in uh, in amateur radio. So that that alone is a victory condition for us. All right. Well, let's. Uh, Let's go ahead and close it down for the day, and I'll uh, I'll be on Slack, and so will everybody else. Uh, so if you're in interested in Neptune, if you're listening to this, this is the Neptune Meetup. Uh, there's a repository on our Open Research Institute GitHub that has all of the work. Uh, this includes the Python models for for this um, system. So this is an OFDM based system for uh, drones and and aeronautics. And it's a uh, heavily uh, based. You, so lots of similarities with LTE. Uh, not nearly as complicated. Takes the best parts of LTE and puts it in the open source for amateur radio. Um, but yes, intended for for drone connections. So it has the Python model. It also has a HDL model for deployment on FPGAs for hardware implementation and also has the specification for FlexLink, which is the physical layer specification, which is soon to be revised. And then we are also adding the uh, Mac layer specification that'll that'll come pretty soon. So active work in progress uh, with lots of interesting things and plenty of opportunities to learn, experiment, and uh, get things published. So if you're interested, uh, please get in touch and go to um, openresearch.institute on the web and click getting started and reach out.